YouTube. This is fun. I, who knew being a YouTuber would be so much fun? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh my gosh, another week of professional wrestling in the books, led, of course, by companies like AEW, NJPW, the list goes on and on. Welcome, everybody, to a special Saturday night edition of AEW Spark. Good evening, good morning, good night to you all. My name is Noah Foster. I am the simple man with me tonight. This is a one on one forum this week. He is the doctor, and that is real, folks. Don't forget it. Dr. Bradley Campo. Bradley, how are you? It's been a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it has, we're, we're in the midst of, um, of flu season and, um, you know, just trying to keep, keep our communities healthy, our patients healthy, and um, just trying to help out our, our neighbors and pick up shifts and take care of one another. But, you know, you, you, you wrestle with a, uh, a crazy schedule, and when you're done wrestling with that, you, you, you go home and you watch wrestling. I keep it's telling people. Work. I keep telling people all the time. You may not understand me, but when it comes to work finally being over, and my work's mentally draining as I just work from my office, uh -huh. uh, I literally get out of this chair, sometimes lay in the bed, and just click, turn on wrestling. Some, I mean, heck, I I encore AW Dynamite NXT UK like twice this week, and that includes late night mm -hmm. Dynamite because I just hope again at the end of the day, we're all just doing what we can to take care of ourselves mentally, spiritually, and physically. And I'm not just saying that because of hashtag Pool Gear Challenge. That should be the challenges and pursuits we pursue as human beings every day. So on behalf of me and Dr. Bradley, I hope you all are doing well and taking care of your families and being safe during this COVID era. We will overcome it together. And that's a fact. And I'm not Eli Drake, so I'm not going to just say that's just an insult. That's just a patch of life, and I just did. <laughs> I want to see Eli Drake in AEW. There, I said it. But I love what he's doing on the primetime specials. But I'm happy to hear that, again, you, again, are taking care of people, providing their, their needs as a first responder at your local uh, pharmacy. But, again, I hope you are, of course, doing everything you can to keep you and your family safe and healthy. And with that being said, before we get started, I just want to say this episode of AEW Spark is dedicated to the recent passing of Road Warrior Animal, who's now up there with Hawk, killed it, I'm sure in heaven, as the Legion of Doom. All I can say is, what a rush. I'm not going to intimidate that voice tonight because I am too damn tired. But with that being oh, said, what a rush. Ah, that was perfect. There, Maybe I'll do that. There we go. Thank you. Bravo. That was for you. That was for you, Adamo. I'm not going to play the thing because I don't want to get a copyright strike. Yeah. I know WWE owns everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> all right, He's let's go ahead. Nice <laughs> yeah, I get a drink of water in that, man. All right, let's go ahead and talk all things All Elite Wrestling. As always, with AW Spark, short term, long term, I always like to start by shedding some light on dark. As they, of course, provide us a 11 match showcase, again, giving many young independent talent support for wrestling folks a chance to really hone and fine tune their crafts against great veterans of the indies across the AEW roster, both young up-and-comers and ones that have been there for decades, like Dustin and Christopher Daniels. And then, of course, we finally get some showing, and I wish they really would do more of this, where the independent talent challenged themselves. And honestly, this probably, on this episode of Dark, I think it was episode 53 or 54, I have to uh, double-check that, I think I just saw my favorite AEW Dark match ever. And it was against two people just pure independent wrestlers, not independent versus AW or AW versus AEW. But I'm just going to go ahead and quickly run it down for you because Dr. Bradley has not uh, watched it all yet. I hope he does. Uh, Stu, Grayson used, <laughs> uh, Stu Grayson used Nightfall and Evil Uno with a uh, side slam. They won for Dark Order uh, in their opening match against uh, Fuego Del Sol and Rembrandt Lewis. Uh, Ricky Starks, absolute Ricky Starks, the biggest win of his career. He defeated, oh, sorry, by the way, folks, spoiler alert, he defeated Christopher Daniels. That is a huge win for this young up-and-comer. And I keep thinking about the mixed forces that SCU has been having, both as a tag team and all three as single stars, especially Frank Kazarian, because that guy, my gosh, he's amazing. Uh, we also had the Butcher and the Blade. Uh, they win with full depth against uh, Calvin Stewart and Puff. And I never knew how much I would like a guy named Pup and his wrestling and his jiggling. He's more funny to me than Grado, and I feel he can go farther in the ring, too. That was actually a pretty hilarious match. I hope I see more of him, too. Uh, following that big spinebuster and win for recently signed on to All Elite Wrestling, 
Mr. Willpower himself, Will Hobbs, as he took on Serpentico with Luffy, of course, in his corner. What a weird tag team that is. Uh, the Lucha Brothers, they get a win with Eddie Kingston in their corner. With the Lucha Brothers uh, driver, as Eddie Kingston uh, watched on in, of course, sheer delight, because those are his boys. They beat the team of Dante Smiley and Max Stardom. Five and ten up the Dark Order. Got their first win as a team with a double stomp power slam combo. I was actually rather impressed with this duo over Risen and Sander Gold. Again, Dark Order. They're strong, it seems, on all fronts now, especially on Dark. That doesn't kind of redundant. Oh, dark Order. Dark. I've already did. Okay, I got the Mr. Broy Lee shirt. All right, I already did. I already did. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Diamond Smith. Has he thrown papers at you yet? Oh, I'm from papers at other people, all right? I'm talking to you, Sean Bully, all right? And other people better get their damn act together in Dark Order. Quit making me say, fuck! There are some fucking idiots! Stop! This week in the chat. But, but I digress. That, that'll be for Wednesday, I'm sure. So, I guess. So, Mr. Brody Lee, for the record, he is still okay with Spark, just not Twitch, right? Just so we're on the same page. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure, as far as I know, but it's not like Mr. Broy Lee is going to show up at my doorstep or their little recruiting guy. Hell, I might as well shoot a recruit video for the Dark Order. Don't hold me to that. Uh, anyway, uh, following that, uh, Diamond Lay Drop split for the team of Sunny Kiss and Joey Janela. Uh, they got the win over – the heck did they face this week? It was a weird uh, duo. Oh, there it is. Kevin Blackwood and Daniel Garcia. Two survivors. What I found interesting is Kevin Blackwood and Diego Garcia, they respectively worked really good in who they were in the ring with from Joy Janela and uh, Sonny Kiss. I was actually impressed though, with this match. It went about uh, 10 minutes. Then, one of my favorite matches of the night, as Serena Deeb took on Kylan King, showed a different side of Kylan mm-hmm. King, really challenged Kylan King in more of a technical bout, as she did make Kylan King tap out to her uh, single leg crab finisher, really bending the leg back, but also trapping the other leg too. Ouch. In a submission, she calls a uh, serenity. Oh, by the way, kind of, uh, Serena Deeb has quarantined herself. She was supposed to be involved in a match with Allison K next week on primetime. But for safety reasons, she's quarantined herself because apparently she was around somebody that was COVID uh, positive. I wish her the best. Hope she gets well. And again, I'm just glad that's a sign her. Sign Kylan King. Uh, following that, Billy Gunn wins with, of course, his famous sir against Mbadu and Cruz with his boy, Austin Gunn. And, of course, Taz was like, meh, 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 meh. As, of course, Taz, Beta Scott, Ricky Starks for most of the show after his match. And uh, who's the other guy? Excalibur. How could I forget him? They also had their chemistry on the commentary table, sharing and so humor and jabs at each other while giving us some decent wrestling analyticals. But I digress. And following this, we got the best match of the night and probably the best match ever on Dark as Lee Johnson and Ben Carter put on a near 12-minute clinic of high risk, near falls, and incredible in-ring wrestling as Lee Johnson, who has been one of my favorites on Dark and is 0 and 14 now, dang it, came so close, but Ben Carter pulled out the freaking win with a frog splash. Absolutely amazing match. For those that have never watched Dark, go watch that match. All the Dark matches are on full on YouTube, literally. So if you got a few moments of your time, go watch some matches from Dark. See who impresses you. Find a new star, an up-and-coming independent wrestler, too. And again, they're not superstars. They're professional wrestlers. This isn't sports entertainment. This is something different. Anyway, uh, following this last match of the night was a tag team match as Eddie Kingston took on Brian Pillman Jr., who I might add, still not signed by AEW. People want him to be signed, but he still works on MLW, as far as I know. But he and Eddie Kingston, real talk, they had a good, strong physical uh, feud. Kitchen sink and spinning back elbow strike, though. Good night, Brian Pillman Jr. As Eddie Kingston continues to work with the boys that have been up and down the same roads or similar roads as him, but also proves why he is a professional wrestler. And at the end of the day, he got the win. Eddie Kingston is a major player that AEW picked up. I'm glad he was there. So, again, Bradley, if you go watch two matches, or three matches, really, go watch Eddie Kingston, Brian Pillman Jr., Lee Johnson yeah. versus Ben Carter, and Kyle King versus Serena Deeb. Those are the three I recommend. All right, well, that being said, let's talk about something I know you saw because this is what defines us as professional wrestling fans versus sports entertainment, enthusiasts. As I, who uh, hashtag non-sports, do not give a damn about the NBA playoffs or the post-show talk, but I stood up during the entire thing doing other stuff, including watching AEW Dark during that time. 
Not a single bit of sleep. Well, I, I took a nap for two minutes, if you can call it that. You close your eyes and you put the TV yeah. on mute. I guess that technically is sleep, so I took a two-minute nap. But this week marked the first ever Late Night Dynamite one-hour special, a simple three-match showcase that also previewed what was to come on this week's AW Dynamite. And folks, we're coming to you Saturday night, September 26th, 9.57 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all right? So be aware of what I'm talking about. This Late Night Dynamite special was really damn good for an hour of professional wrestling, and I would love to do it again. And apparently got great viewership considering a show after an NBA game, but also a wrestling show. Half a million viewers. I thought they were going to pick up only 300,000. But with that being said, we had a three-match showcase. It was the ever-impressive Ben Carter taking on Scorpio Scott, Scott, Scott in the uh, opener. Anna J of the Dark Order, the Queen Slayer, number 99, took on Brandy Rhodes. And on our main event, it was Sean Spears taking on the guy that eliminated him from the Casino Barrel back at AW All Out, uh, Matt Seidel. I really enjoyed all three of these matches. And honestly, yep, I, I feel like the stars of the show was the independent talent. Congratulations to Matt Seidel, Anna Jay, and Ben Carter for incredible performances under that intense heat, the time, and just who you were up against. Now, truth be told, only one of those three actually won their match, and that was, of course, Anna J. Yes! Tell me they're trying to really build new stars, super wrestlers, excuse me, stars, wrestlers, whatever the hell you want to call it, as long as you don't say superstars. Otherwise, get the hell out of here. Uh, and literally, <laughs> Anna J, she is a legit force, it seems like, in the Dark Quarter. I'd like to chemistry with her and Stu Grayson. One of my favorite segments every week is the Dark Quarter segments, especially with her and Stu. Love their chemistry. As Stu's, like, intense, I'm afraid nobody. But as soon as Anna Jay's in the play, you're like, eh, you may want to know your place and calm down. I can only imagine what they're talking about. Anyway, I really enjoyed yeah. this, but let's talk about this a little bit in general because we can break down each one of these matches, but then we'll be here all night. But let's go ahead and just talk about in general Late Night Dynamite. Dr. Bradley, what was your thoughts on this first ever edition of Late Night Dynamite? What match impressed you the most? Who impressed you the most out of the six that were on the show? Uh, you know, I mean, all, all three matches were just um... – Really, really just solid, great work. I mean, just for, for an hour show, I mean, um, you, you really couldn't ask for anything more um, than what was delivered. Uh, but honestly, that, that match with um, Ben Carter and Scorpio Sky to open up the show just, uh, I mean, when, when, you, when you ask me about Late Night Dynamite, that is the very first thing that comes to my mind because they set the tone and they set the bar for that hour long special. Yeah, absolutely. And Ben Carter coming in eyelash of being Scorpio Sky, who was lucky to pull up the T kill in the end after also getting busted open, it seemed too. Ben Carter, it he is definitely someone to look out for. This guy that just been on the UK scene in his young twenties, had no idea who he is, just shows up yeah. at AEW Dynamite. He has made an emphatic statement so far in the few matches he's been involved in. And again, he already has his first win. So that's got to mean big face for this guy. He is definitely, I feel like, all elite mm -hmm. material. And I hope to see more of him going forward. But, of course, as we learned, he has also fallen to COVID-19. So, of course, he's exercising safety and trying to get well. Prayers are with you, sir. Please get well soon. He doesn't blame AW Dynamite the way it came in afterwards, as AW Dynamite does everything they can to protect the talent, the staff, and even the fans. And like other companies that are trying to do better but didn't do great at first. Nobody is perfect, but at least this company put more efforts into precautionary measures in the long run. Just saying. Anyway, yeah, uh, Scorpio Sky, incredible match against Ben Carr. Scorpio Sky gets the win. Anna J beats Brandy Rose via the Queen Slayer submission, putting her to sleep. Even though Brandy pulled off a shot of Brandy, thank God Stu Grayson was out there to distract the ref because Stu Grayson, he was fixing to blow a gasket, I think about Anna J maybe losing to Brandy. It makes me wonder if something's being set up between Anna J and Stu Grayson beyond being the elite. Hey uh, anyway, that was a really good match, and I'll give Crabber credits too. Brandy has gotten better in ring. I yeah. don't want to see her pushed as an in-ring wrestler, because again, she is an executive vice president. She's beyond that. She's the chief brand officer, and I don't want to see a Stephanie complex in AEW. But I respect the mm -hmm. effort Brandy put into her match, and hopefully she uses that going forward to put over new up-and-coming great talent like Anna Jay. And amazing what Anna Jay mm -hmm. has been through in just a little over the first year of herself in a professional wrestling career and less than a year in AEW alone. 
literally less than six months, AEW has already made their first singles females star, period. Uh, yeah. With that being said, the main event with Sean Spears, Matt Seidel, who apparently Scorpio Sky has mutual respect and friendship with Matt Seidel. They're probably going to get it on after both of them win their matches. Well, that didn't happen now, did it? As Matt Seidel took Sean Spears to the limit, but after Sean Spears got out of the ring at one point, what does the ever so influential manager of Sean Spears do, Tully Blanchard? He uh, slips him a uh, steel, what would you call that, slug yeah. or something like that. And that glove comes into play with a fatal knockout blow that allows Sean Spears to sell for his death by driving C4. And Sean Spears gets the win in a very competitive main event that apparently more people looked into beyond uh, the other two matches. I look at the YouTube views. But still, overall, great viewership. Great viewership all for the show. Great outlook, presentation, setup. I definitely would do it again in a heartbeat. If this was something else outside NJPW and AEW, probably not. But this was worth every second of waiting for and every second to watch. All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about this past week's Dynamite because we wonder, what the hell is going on with the Young Bucks? Where is Kenny Omega's head at? Is he truly going on a singles run? Can Orange Cassidy pull up the upset of a lifetime? And what's going to happen in the six-man tag that previews the AEW Championship match? Oh, that didn't happen, did it? Because, ladies and gentlemen... Nope. Lance Archer has also basically tested positive for COVID-19 and is doing everything he can in precautions to take care of himself and his family. And for those that are toxic idiots that are talking about family and friends and blaming that shit, fuck you. You're stupid. Uh, with that being said, what does AEW do? Well, who am I kidding? What does John Moxley do? Screw it. I'm putting the title line, babe. What? An AEW World Championship match out of nowhere. Now, who do you think would challenge for that? A GI wonder. I've been challenged. Let's think about this. I've been about previous weeks. I'm like, Oh, I know. There's a guy that says he was never eliminated from the Casino Battle Royale and believes he's a rightful challenger. And they made it happen. Finally, Eddie Kingston yep. was putting his money where his mouth is. And Eddie Kingston was set up to challenge John Moxley in the main event for the AEW World Championship. As far as Ricky Starks, Darby Allin, Will Hobbs, and Brian Cage, pfft, nothing happened with them. But apparently, Brian Cage, he might have had a headache, so he also was off time as well. I hope he's okay, too. I don't know whether or not he was tested positive for COVID as well. Again, nobody is safe from this virus. But with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about what we saw this week on this securely interesting impromptu AEW Dynamite. So, happy Miro Day, Dr. Bradley. Miro, he had his debut with, you know, because he's the best man, he had his debut with the Super Bad, Kip Sabian, with Super Bad Girl, Penelope Ford in his corner. And they took on the team of Joey Kiss and uh, – Joey Kiss, oh, bot. That Maybe they should call themselves that. <laughs> Joey Sonny Janella. Kiss and Joey Janela. And yeah. I must say, this was an interesting match. It was interesting how much they teased Miro getting involved because everybody wanted to see Miro go in there and crush somebody. And when it finally happened, people were on their feet. But I'm a little concerned. I don't know about you but as a doctor. At one point, it looked like Miro might have legitimately injured himself. And I figure it was also answered with backstage um, concern as well. In the end, they did get the win. And as Miro now causes accolade, damn all the, Miro did get the win via submission for the team. I don't know about, overall though, I enjoyed this tag match. It was a fun bout, great way to show Miro's power as Miro looked dead serious through all out. And it's still with the video game references. I like that. Focusing on the Twitch fan. Go follow Kip Sammy and Miro on Twitch. There's your cheap plug. I enjoyed this match, but I'm curious what Miro's state is. Give me your thoughts on this tag match and Miro's debut. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, the, the whole formula of what AEW establishes that the way to kick off a great wrestling show is to, to utilize your strength. And right now, AEW's strength is tag team wrestling. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, they, they, I think they played it safe. They're like, you know, let, let's get, you know, a lot of talent in, in the ring um let's get Miro and involved with people that he can work with um to really showcase his power um you know fans have been waiting for a Miro AEW debut for some months now and um I thought the match was good I mean it was it was a good start it wasn't the best tag team match I've seen them open with but it was still a very very good opener um I feel like Miro was his debut was teased, and then with the match itself, I feel like 
it was teased a little too much. I would have liked to have seen him go in there and just really clean house and establish, establish some dominance for his character. I mean, if, if you're going to be calling Miro the best man, that he is the best man, he's elite, then really make that statement mean something. Give, give some weight to what he said in the previous weeks. Yeah, like I said, when you see me on Twitch, you know I am the best gamer. When you see me on Dynamite, you know I am the best wrestler because anybody I'm in the ring with, I crush. My name is Miran Ali. I say he's Ali, but yeah, maybe they're just slowly building that in because, again, the real focal point here is what the hell are we going to expect from this freaking wedding, let alone bachelor party? It's funny right now that you look at wrestling. We got two wrestling weddings basically in the build. We got Impact Wrestling with Rosemary and Johnny Bravo. What? And we got this wedding, legitimately more, it seems, with Kip Sabin and Penelope Ford. And I'm wondering at this point right now, who's going to host the best bachelor party and the best wedding? And something <laughs> inside me feels like it's going to be AEW. But I feel like my friend Paul Mead's going to say Impact Wrestling because he follows Impact more. But I digress. Uh, anyway, following that, we go straight into another. Oh, no, we don't. Real talk. Eddie Kingston comes out. Hot fire with a microphone says, it's me and Moxley tonight for the world championship. I was never eliminated from that battle royale. 18 years says I deserve this shot. Me and John Moxley are cut from the same cloth, some would say. But John Moxley sold his soul out to the devil and went to the land of sports entertainment. I never sold out. Damn. Talk about calling out pass. And literally that lit a yeah. hell storm under John Moxley, who came out literally confronting the man. When it comes to Eddie Kingston, when he talks, you listen, but more so people answer back. And he's ready to fight somebody or someone's ready to fight him based on his words. And literally, John Moxley, no words. He came to that ring, went to face face that man. They were about to blow up and get it on. Thank goodness for all the referees. Oh, my gosh. That was intense. Speaking of intense, let's go ahead and talk about this singles match as we wonder what is next for Heyman and Page as who joined us on commentary. Kenny Omega, as he watches on Heyman and Page, takes on Dark Order. Evil's Uno alone. This match was very intriguing to me. But before I give my thoughts on it, give me your thoughts on this match and Kenny Omega's standpoint on it from the commentary position. I mean, just like the previous week, um, um, Hangman, um, you know, he, I thought he had a really impressive match with Frankie Kazarian. On, on last week's show and this week putting him against Evil Uno. Um, different type of match, but I think it really showcases uh, the talent that Hangman has. He, he is a future champion in the company. I was um, thoroughly impressed with, with, with his work. I think Kenny Omega being in, in the, the shadows on commentary, um, you know, I, I think that this could be just some seeds planned for some long-term term booking and storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and I think we've talked about this before, but I would love to see uh, a heel Kenny as champion get dethroned by uh, a face Hangman Adam Page to become the new face champion down the line. And that is something that I think could very well happen. I mean, when you look at Hangman, um, and you look at his physique, his attitude, um, he almost kind of reminds me of, um, uh, and some people may laugh at this comparison, but I get vibes of uh, stunning Steve Austin from the 90s where you just really saw something special, but you just had to wait for that moment to explode. And I'm not saying that Hangman's going to go and make a complete change to his character the way that Steve Austin did to Stone Cold, but... I think there's definitely some potential for some some greatness. Okay. Uh, wait, did he freeze? You know, <laughs> making some really good memories. Yeah. I, I liked what you did there with the stunning uh, Steve Austin uh, thing. Um, when I think about this match, I think about it like this on two fronts. One, we're further looking into the idea of a heel Kenny Omega finally going on a singles run versus a more sympathetic, trying to mend broken bridges, face Hangman Adam Page. And then I also look at this idea of the Dark Order and how Evil Uno right now is kind of, I feel like, a more sympathetic type person in the Dark Order. For one, Kukabuna, as a chorus during this match, who was watching on during most of it, but the Dark Order. What I also found extremely interesting though, as this match progressed and you thought the Dark Order was going to get involved, 
he sends the Dark Order, Evil Uno sends the Dark Order to the back. Now, I don't know necessarily what that means, whether or not he was trying to prove something to Mr. Boy Lee, or more so, the person he's trying to help in the Dark Order, Coca Cabana. Because Coca Cabana right now, he is still on very thin eyes and apparently on very negative terms with the exalted one, current TNT champion, uh, Mr. Brody Lee. During this match as well, Kenny Omega, he put over uh, Heyman and Page, saying that he's seen stuff that he wasn't aware of that he was capable of. He's pulling out some tricks I haven't seen before. In the end, both of these men had a very competitive bout, but of course, the ace in the hole, buckshot lariat. That got Ke Heyman and Page the win. He continues his renewed singles run right now, unblemished, two in a row. As Kenny Omega, he looked on again. He emphatically states that, I don't see the tag team thing happening. We had our run with it. Our plan was to go for the entire tag team roster. That didn't happen. And now I'm going to focus on a singles run, and he just walks away. No acknowledgement of Paige outside the commentary table. And Paige wonders where he went. Well, he's gone. So I guess we'll continue to see uh, where this goes, as we have yet to see Kenny Omega get back in the ring as well for aiming action, and maybe see this from another side. Maybe see if him and Paige watches on from a bar or just commentary himself during Kenny Omega's first match in his renewed singles run. But again, I don't think that first match is going to happen until we see the return of the cleaner. Just saying. And again, with an anniversary coming up, I expect big things to happen. But again, I'll foreshadow that later because we're still three weeks out from that. Let's go ahead, though, and look at another part of the Elite now. As we go backstage, as Tony Giovanni, he tries to get an interview, reluctantly, with Matt Jackson. You wonder why. Uh, basically, as soon as the door opens, he probably was going to super kick. Matt's like, whoa, come down, Tony. I was going to super kick you. No, 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 it's all good. So Tony, again, they respect him. So Tony asks him the question about FTR, and Matt gets frustrated and asks for a different question, like no comment. He just basically defra detours the question. And then basically following this, Tony Giovanni tries to get more out of the Bucks, and they refuse to answer on basically anything. So what do the Bucks do? Uh, Matt, by the way, Nick, nowhere on this segment at all. We don't even know if he's in that room. Matt basically is like, oh, can I see? Can I see your phone? Can I see your phone, Tony? You got your phone on you? I always got my phone on me. And then all of a sudden, crash! There goes his phone. screen. like, what the hell, man? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, you know what? This this really plays it. They just throw a bunch of hundred dollar bills apparently in front of Tony's face onto the floor. I close the door. And he's like, "Gee," <laughs> and uh, go go upgrade. And uh, Tony Giovanni with one last comment: We should put that in their book. Maybe a new chapter. Chapter <laughs> the Bucks. Yeah. Destroying the business. Uh, give me your thoughts right now on the Young Bucks mindset. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, it's um, it, it's definitely a, a, an interesting character change because they they definitely have heel characteristics, but they're they're not really your your typical heel in the sense that they're they're going out there at least not yet anyway, where they're just really just trying to really just you know piss off the fans and get legit heat. It, it's more of there's just this attitude of complete apathy and uh, just total lack of respect for authority, which very much is a heel uh, mindset in and of itself. But um, there's still a little bit of that, that chipper young buck um, sort of like mindset with the little quips they make in their, in their commentary. So uh, I'm interested to see how, these characters unfold. Yeah, and again, we haven't seen the Bucks in every action either. And again, that makes me believe all three of these men, they're going to form that unique heel elite. And I could see that being our culmination at the end of the anniversary show. But maybe I'm just figuring way too far ahead. With that being said, let's move on to our next match. All right. What? 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 Forget what? Okay, Dr. Bradley. This is all you. Give me your thoughts on the TNT Championship match between Mr. Broyley with the Dark Order and against freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy and what happened afterwards. Take it away. Oh, gosh. Uh, I absolutely love that match. Um, I, that, that was just... So, so just a clash of different styles. I mean, you got this big, you know, you know, uh, powerhouse like Brody Lee, and you got this young, charismatic, 
hipster looking dude who puts his hands in his pockets, <laughs> Orange Cassidy. Just the way they, the way they, the, their characters played off each other. Um, that that was absolutely great. Um, you know, I, I think um, the the whole match, both of them came out lo- looking better, uh, just in terms of what they put in. Uh, I mean, that 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 was a great TNT Championship match. I mean that 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 really stood out to me. I was just I, I was on my feet, uh, out of my chair for that match. match. All right, fair enough. Before we talk about the epilogue, let me go ahead and look at some brief thoughts here. First up out of the gate, Orange Cassidy, no fear, no emotion, no reaction whatsoever. Ana Jay immediately tries to get in the man's face. What does Orange Cassidy do? Puts the aviators on her. Ana Jay looked yeah. better than those, but she couldn't believe that. Again, Ana Jay, her being part of the Dark Order is the next best face is Mr. Broiley. There, I said it. Uh, anyway, Following this, the Dark Order was definitely involved here at ringside, not just on the stage, but literally at ringside. John Silver, of course, holding the title, everyone's favorite punching bag to see. Uh, we had, of course, other numbers as well. I don't remember them. Uh, basically, though, Orange is not intimidated, as Shabani says, and JR, of course, acknowledges this big dangerous man was obviously on a roll. And literally, the match starts off with typical Orange Cassidy fashion. Hands in pockets, he goes for those lethal kicks. Then Mr. Bradley takes his head off. <laughs> Uh, following this, there were multiple times where Orange Cassidy was on the outside of the ring. He was, of course, attacked by the Dark Order. People wanted to see a legit, fair, one-on-one match. Rep unaware of all the shenanigans that ensued. As Orange Cassidy goes for a suicide dive, hands in pockets, the Dark Order catches him, with the exception of Ana Jay, obviously. And literally, they hold him in place and sacrifice themselves for Mr. Broily to pull off a torpe suicida. What the hell? Anyway... Cassidy can't even keep his feet underneath him, or is this a ploy? We wonder how long Orange Cassidy just lets the opponent feel like they're in a state of comfort of just destroying this guy. And that was the story for most of this match. Then what happens? Orange Cassidy becomes elusive as it looks like Miss Burley is ready to end this quickly. Go to the disagreeable areas. Not once, not twice, but three times. Orange Cassidy pulling off a Jay White tactic. Aware or unaware, I don't know. I don't know how this man works or his mind works. Just sits down. Mr. Broy Lee's getting frustrated. There was a couple of times where Orange Cassidy goes for the DDT. He cannot yeah. pull it off off the big guy. But when he finally does off the top row, biggest pop of the match on a jam and shot near fall. There was another time after uh, two elbow suicidos on uh, Brody Lee that Orange hits a stunner and uses a diving DDT on the exalted one. Still not enough. Another DDT airway crash on Mr. Brody Lee, but Brody kicked out. This was the closest fall of the match. John Silver gets involved, distracts Orange Cassidy for Mr. Brody Lee to basically destroy the guy finally with a discus lariat. And Mr. Brody Lee does win one, two, three. And it looks like, of course, Dark Order continues their reign of destruction, momentum, dark devastation. Speaking of dark, lights go out. I see some weird red, fiery, amber vibe on the screen. I hear the choir. I'm like, no way. No way. Now, for those that follow maybe Cody, he did send out a text message of a picture of a map from his location to, oh, I don't know, Jacksonville, Florida, within three hours. And here we are at the near top point of the first hour, and we're wondering what happens. And Jared's like, uh, until we see somebody, all it is is music. We know that choir noise. We see the smoke. And then we see this weird hall illustration. Then we hear the voice, we hear downstate. Dark Cody, a true American nightmare redefined with his logo saying Cody is dead, but then goes to this full like silver brand ember, full black hair, brooch, new jacket, bigger tie knot, more sadistic, destructive, more vengeful Cody is back. I did not see that coming this soon. Wow. As Excalibur says, Cody with a little bit of sadistic size, he does take out the Dark Order as Ana Jay and Mr. Brody get the hell out of Dodge while the other ones suffer, including uh, one of them in a uh, figure four uh, leg lock, could have literally just snapped the ankle. Following this, we get Mr. Broly in a backstage segment with Dasha. Well, thankfully, Ana Jay saved Dasha because Mr. Broly, he came in pissed hellfire. <laughs> talking about, you gotta yeah. be kidding me! You gotta be kidding me! Who has the audacity to do this sort of stuff? Here I am doing the work, being undeniable while your wife is just having thirst pics on Instagram. What sort of man are you, Cody? I can't believe you did this. 
I'm gonna cut you down. And then he has John Silver off screen, literally hand him something. What the hell are we about to get? Maybe in two weeks, he literally is like, I'm gonna take this dog collar, wrap it around your tattooed neck. You'll have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. So Cody, answer me, I will give you one week. Are you a man or are you a coward? Whoa, a dog collar match? Now, for those of you who don't know, a dog collar match is where both men are restrained by a dog collar, by a chain, and literally, they beat the hell of a charge to get a win. Bradley, what the hell? Give me your thoughts on Mr. Bradley's emphatic promo and the proposed match to sell this. Well, you asked me originally my thoughts on the match with, with, with Orange Cassidy and Brody Lee in the, in the aftermath. I, in the aftermath, I think, is just a whole other topic. I think it's good we're talking about this now because um, we, we knew that Cody was going to be um, out for a little while on screen with the injury. and Five weeks. Had some other, yeah, had some other projects going on TV. But I, I thought it was a great, um, a great surprise. Um, you, you could say that that was probably the biggest moment of the night for Dynamite. It's actually when number two. Out. It's actually number two among the AEW top five, as they literally list the clips by numbers. So you're very close. Yeah, I think him coming in with a new new attire, new look, um, new, new attitude. Um, I mean. You know, it, it just it just kind of gives you the goosebumps and the, those shivers, like, you know, okay, you know, payback's a bitch now. What's what's going to happen? Uh, seeing him clean house in the dark order was exciting. Um, the the dog collar match, um, you know, we were on Facebook talking about, and I think me and uh, Mike Phillips and Shane Wells were kind of commenting on a Facebook post about it, and you know, Shane was like, you know saying that you know he hadn't seen a dog collar match in, in in years i think since like the 80s or something like that the last dog uh, collar match i saw was among women in impact wrestling and they call it a yeah. demon dog collar match and i think yeah. it was jessica havoc and sue young or was it rosemary and jessica i can't remember it was it was some combination between rosemary jessica havoc and sue young among a storyline and this was way after when Ali, yeah, Ali was previously part of Impact and was the dark bunny un, without a soul and was basically also involved in a dog color match, but more so for possession. Well, but anyway, that's just my history of Impact Wrestling. Anyway, continue. <clears throat> well, well, you have to consider how Cody went out. Um, he basically was destroyed. Yeah. Lost his title. So, you know, what, what, what do you do? You maybe you, you do a soft reboot, then you do a match and you do something that's out of the ordinary that brings out just the physicality and something that is also very psychological for uh, one man who's broken on getting redemption and another who's just this psychotic leader that's yeah, hell bent on growing his organization. So, I, you know, it's it's the old saying, the shoe fits where, and I think that it, it, it's an interesting concept, and I think it's going to bring out just uh, some real uh, ugliness in the ring, but I think that's the goal, is we're going to see some, uh, we're going to see some violence, and we're going to see some, uh, uh, you know, and who knows if the championship will be on the line, but I think, uh even if it's not, it's going to be a match that's going to be built on um, uh, what, what I'm going to go ahead and say is some real retribution in, in, in this uh, uh, <laughs> this moment right here. Uh, I like what you yeah, did there. I like what you did there, to be fair, because I can talk about that <laughs> in our night, but I already did a simple reacting video to that, so it's all good. All right. Yeah, and another, and another thing I think about, what is now the state of the nightmare family? No Arn Anderson. What does Cody mm -hmm. think? Of, what does Dustin think of this? What does Brandy think of this? Could Brandy come into play at all mm -hmm. in this? Try and exact redemption on Jay. Does she go wear uh, all black, change her hair up? How much does this change the Nightmare family and what they stand for? Is Allie still part of the Nightmare family? Gay Allie. Hope she continues her singles run. But I know some programs being set up there too with QT Marshall and Blade, apparently. And we still have yet to see uh, that continuation. So, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of things to consider, but it's a different side now to Cody. 
and it's a different way to think about the Nightmare Family, and it's a new wrinkle to this feud ultimately of the Dark Order versus the Nightmare Family. And I'm curious to see where this goes from here, but there's no doubt in my mind that Cody's going to accept that challenge. Now I'm just wondering what sort of promo mm -hmm. he'll deliver. We'll have to wait and see. Maybe they'll do a Road to Dynamite uh, next week. I, we haven't seen one of those in a while. Uh, meanwhile, let's go ahead and look at the Inner Circle versus Private Party and Hardy. As Matt Hardy and Private Party, they were out there as Isaiah Cassidy and Mark Quan looked like they were going to a slumber party, in my opinion. And basically, they call out uh, Chris Jericho because we all know what happened last week with Matt Hardy. He was attacked by a masked man at some point backstage. You wonder who? Who shows up? Hager, Jericho, and the other member of the Inner Circle, Floyd the Baseball Bat. And we all knew right then and there who attacked Matt Hardy. It was them. Chris Jericho, the more things change, the more they stay the same, as Matt Hardy says. And as soon as he starts saying that, cue Judas! And the sing-along as Jericho comes out with the Inner Circle. And then also talks mm -hmm. about Sammy Guevara is not here because of what you did, Matt Hardy. Except he is. And we have the full Inner Circle back, including the Spanish god, Sammy Guevara. And everyone's happy about Sammy Guevara being back, too. I'm sure everyone's getting ready for the Jericho and Sammy Guevara memes that are going to happen over the week that people love to make. Good God almighty. Anyway, <laughs> Jericho said, trust me, if I was going to take you out with a bat, I would have took did it to your face. But is that what you want? If they clear, I'll fight you. I'll fight all the inner circle. Matt Hardy again, eh, kind of going back on what he said regarding what he was going to do with his wife and his family and his well-being. Not a smart idea. In comes Mark Kwan, who interrupts Hardy and says, Matt, we need you. Take the time you need to heal, but I'm here. We think about Chris Jericho and how he's being booked in AEW and what he wants to do with his time in AEW, how much he enjoys AEW. Is okay with stopping wrestling just being commentary. We think about what Jericho's doing. He's putting over the younger talent. He put the brand on the map as the champion, taking on Heyman and Page with ref Aubrey Edwards, who he personally asked for to be the referee. He put over Darby Allen in a championship match, who Darby Allen idolized. He Put over John Moxley, where they finally culminated with John Moxley getting the title at Revolution. And now we have the solo chemistry with MJF and Jericho at times. And now we look at Jericho and Orange Cassidy and Orange Cassidy's star power rise. Let's see what we can do in private party, as it looks like Mark Quan wants to step up to the plate and says, I'm here. I'll get Jericho his money before you have to do it. But before Quan talks about that, Isaiah Cassidy, the guy who got the better of Jericho that following the previous week, he says, I got this. I'm issuing you a challenge one-on-one -on -one, because everyone's counting me out. But what if a young up-and-comer beats Chris Jericho on Dynamite next week? As Jericho just smiles in a sly way, it seems, to this. And what if I make Chris Jericho final line, my love trumpy on biatch? Okay. So it's official. The match will take place next week. We are going to get Isaiah Cassidy versus Wachamayan, Lester God, the Demo God, whatever the hell you want to call him, the GOAT, Chris Jericho. As we look more into this, though, before we uh, continue on with this, Chris Jericho is backstage. He confirms and teases idea, but who comes into play? MJF. And these two basically talk about how they respect each other and we weren't calling each other losers. I don't know about you, but you figure about what MJF said the previous week from last week about joining something or building something. Dr. Bradley, give me your thoughts first off, before we talk about MJF and Jericho, give me your thoughts on private parties stepping up, in particular, Isaiah Cassidy. Well, there, there's, we've had a lot of discussions online about, about, you know, the tag team division and some of the different tag teams and, um, uh, I think a lot of the general consensus about I think a lot of the um, inner circle, uh, pun intended, of wrestling fans that we interact with. Um, yeah, no, I'm 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 on a roll tonight. I know. There you are. Uh, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, you're having but, fun. That's um, all I care about. You're having yeah, fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think the general consensus is that you know it seemed like Private Party had like a great start. And then they they kind of fizzled out a little bit, but now they seem to be somewhat on an upswing again in terms of what they're showcasing in the ring. Um, they haven't really had too many victories, but I think that you put a guy like Mark Quinn and show what he can do with Chris Jericho, 
in the ring, I think it's going to add to the credibility if he can hang with Jericho, say 10, 15 minutes, just let him show what he can do. Um, but I say I cast the Mark Quinn already showed what he could do when he took on uh, Cody for the TNT title back during Cody's TNT run. That's what I say yeah. I cast the versus Chris Jericho. Oh, it's I think, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's a, I'm sorry. We were, we were, we were both, we were talking about Mark Quinn for saying, yeah, he, he did, he had a good match with, uh, with Cody. Yep. So we have seen that it, it's, it's not in recent memory, but since we're talking about it, we can remind the viewers and fans, hey, go back and if you're like me and you got YouTube TV and you've been recording Dynamite, go find that episode and rewatch it and rewatch that match. Get that back in your mindset. And now let's do what the other half of Power Party can do in a singles match. Yeah. Isaiah Cassidy yeah. takes on the Chris Jericho. Yeah. yeah, and you know, you, you got you, they've already got star power like Matt Hardy in the corner, who's just kind of been on screen really put, promoting and pushing these guys. Very much. Um, you know, let, let, let Isaiah Cassidy have those 10, 15 minutes of on-screen time. Um, and, you know, you also have to consider the fact that this could be adding to, a, to some storytelling in the sense that you've got Chris Jericho and Jake Hager wanting to enter the, the tag team division to go up the tag belt. You could also, from here, set up a feud between private party and the inner circle. Yeah, you could do that, actually. That's not a bad thought at all. And again, it's a different way to take on yeah. the circle because you wonder with Sammy back, is he going to renew hostilities with Matt Hardy? I personally hope not. But clearly Matt Hardy is going to be involved in this. How much is Matt Hardy going to be influenced in this come the big end all? And what will be the end all, which I don't see being as big as Stam Stampede between Elite and the freaking inner circle, which apparently I heard was played during halftime during a Jaguars game. Now, I would actually watch a football game if you give me a halftime show with wrestling. There, I said it. But anyway, I thought that was just pretty funny. <laughs> All right. I like what you uh, said there. So moving on uh, from there, we talk about the chemistry. We talk about the outlook of Chris Jericho and MJF. Give me your thoughts on these two whenever they meet. It's like, I mutually respect you. I secretly hate you. And then we hear MJF talking about joining something or making something. If you if MJF is making something, what do you see him calling it? Who could possibly be in it? Or but flat out, do you see MJF joining the inner circle or trying to take it over? Well, it's funny that you you asked that question because um, I think it was a couple weeks ago. Um, MJF, you know, talked about you know in a promo after having a squash match, you know, joining a faction. Um, so may, maybe that's playing the seeds in the viewers' minds. We, we just weren't aware, but I think if you put someone like MJF in the inner circle, it, you're, you're just setting yourself up for an eventual power struggle, struggle between him and Jericho. Um, because in, in terms of character, um, MJF and Jericho are really cut from the same cloth, the type of characters they portray on screen. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so the, the, the difference, though, is it's, it's almost kind of like, um, you know, almost like you could say it's almost like the, the father and the son, the, the <laughs> older brother, the younger brother. But it's, they're, it's almost like they're the same type of person, but you got the one who's older, who's wiser, more experienced. You got, you got the younger guy with a chip on his shoulder um, who's out to prove something. So you've got all the right ingredients for a great story. Um, the question is now is how do they execute it? What do they do? How do they create this um, five-star match that we're hoping to see? Right. And I'm sure that's going to unfold over time because, again, we have to wonder, MJF and Wardlow, change plans. What's going on with these two? What's going to happen? Are we set up eventually Chris Jericho and Hager versus MJF and Wardlow? What could that lead to? Longer-term plans down the line because right now it looks like short-term plans that we know of. Chris Jericho wants to take on Matt Hardy. But for right now, it's Isaiah Cassidy stepping up on Matt Hardy's behalf against Chris Jericho. We'll see how that all falls out next week. All right, moving on from there, let's talk about the AEW World Tag Team Championships. As FTRs and Dash Harwood and Cash Wheeler current champs coming by Tully Blanchard, they were interviewed in the ring by Tony Schiavone. And basically, they were talking about how they're going to handle 
the championship matches instead of being 60 minutes so new fans can see the tag in action they looked at the contracts and know what they could do with tv time 20 minutes so they are simply calling this a 20 minute rush with greatness and the first ones that are going to be honored for this are uh, they were trying to forget the initials cow blah 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 it's scu christopher daniels and uh kazarian and basically they basically said um they're going to have a brush with greatness it should be a great match but they got no chance but just immediately rip that off they start insulting the best friends calling them glorified backyard wrestlers and kill the best friends coming out literally trying to talk about them in place because look at what we did last week with Centennial RTs. That wasn't a match. That was a war. But we're ready for a match. If you want to do it, let's do it right now. And it looked like, are you serious? 20 minutes? Wait, no, no, no. We got people what's the rest of the show. There's no way this is happening. And of course, they literally turn about face. No, 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 no. They thought it was unfair because of the fact you guys are not 100%. You're bruised and battered. So we're gonna wait until you're 100%, and then you could, guys might get a brush for greatness because you are the number one contenders, it seems, according to the rankings. But for now, top guys out. And we finished this segment simply with Chuck calling them wings. Really? TV 14, that's the best insult you can come up with, weenies. I get it, it's the best friend, so of course they're gonna be all Jolio and stuff, but weenies, I can only imagine the amount of SpongeBob, no meaties around signs on Twitter from that. Are you freaking Honestly, kidding me? I I'm surprised there's not been a meme put together yet of uh, Chuck Taylor yelling out the word uh, weenies and then below Roman Reigns going, what kind of suffering succotash are you talking about? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> freaking worlds collide. <laughs> AEW and WWE. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, well, never say never. I'm sure if someone watches this, they're going to make it. We all know how creative Wrestle Joy is. Just look at Amy, Teddy, yeah. uh, Mark Bell. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying. I'm sure one of them's going to be like this and be like, do something. Heck, I called out, I, I, I tagged Amy following a comment that was made during the Dark Order match. It's like a weird yeah. Adams family. Someone needs to make the Adams family yeah. the Dark Order, okay? They did it with The Office. Uh, Amy did it with the Friends feed with uh, Eddie Kazan and his family. Mm -hmm. Now we need an Adams family. Especially we're heading in October. We need the Adams family Dark yeah. Order entrance video. Unfortunately, I like the capability and the editing yeah. time to do that. Otherwise, I would try that myself. Oh, man. I but, but, since, but, but since we're talking about it, I will say it, it didn't – for – to have uh, Chuck Taylor say something like that, you know, when I, as an afterthought, it didn't really seem too out of character for him to say. Like, that's why was I was like, okay, thing? I get it. Yeah, yeah, I was like, all right, but it was. It, it, I cringed a little bit. And I was like, you know what? It, it it sounds like something that Chuck Taylor would say based on his character. I'm like, I'll, I'll go with it, but um, you know. Uh, it was what it was. Um, uh, we, I think I saw a great meme on the Team All Elite page on Facebook earlier with uh, Dax Harwood standing in front of a weenie truck. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I saw that. I, I kind of laughed. <laughs> I did see I was that. Actually, I, was actually, I was actually on my lunch break at work today. And I was on <laughs> Facebook and I, I just happened to see it. And I was like, I, I remember that. I'm like, all right, that's, yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, I mean, who knows, I mean, who knows where that came from? Even some of the wrestlers have uh, some great memes. Like, you know, Kenny Omega shared that meme with Cody and that Funny. one, the, the one guy from, I think, that children's show or whatever. They yeah. really look very similar. It, it's, it's amazing how memes have taken over the internet and have been like a creative outlet for humor and also controversy. Just saying. Yeah. Oh, good yeah. Lord. All right, well, let's not go into anything controversial as it looks like whatever might have happened with Eva Lisa Fundal Rosa did not really come into play here. But this was a really good women's tag match as we had champions, NWA World Women's Champion Fundal Rosa and AEW Women's Champion Hikaru Ishida. They tag team tonight, at the, that night, excuse me. And they took on the duel of the first ever winners of the Women's Tag Team Cup, Eva Lisa Diamante Las Cincalas. Uh, I really thought this was a pretty good tag match. They gave them a good lot of time, which I appreciate. It seems like right now they really are trying to put more time into the women's division. 
They just have to figure out now more challengers for Hikaru Shida, but that's a whole other discussion. Uh, in the end, though, Thunder Rosa, Hikaru Shida, they literally uh, worked off each other, and they came back to hit double knees on Diamete and uh, Thunder, and, uh, excuse me, Ivelisse, after they got the early uh, pre-match attack, of course, because Ivelisse, Diamete, straight fire and fuego. They went right after both champions. Thunder Rosa, though, she took over control, deep arm drags. Diamete, though, with a precise sit-out sent on for a near fall. As the uh, match progressed, we had a Falcon Arrow from Shida. I thought she'd done the deal. No, not quite. Thunder Rosa attempts knee strike, Ivelisse, Ivelisse. Ivelisse and Thunder Rosa met more of each other as Diamete and Hikaru Shida, they met more of each other. Diamete goes for the cold red towards the end when we finally have the two legal women in the ring, but that doesn't work. As uh, Thunder Rosa blocks it, saves her partner with a DVD, and Shida finally ends Diamete with, off the ropes, bang, that running knee strike, scores the pinfall win. Not a bad outing for these first two great champions as an impromptu tag team. And I wonder how far they could maybe roll with this and what else lies in play for the women's division and how much more influence Thunder Rosa could be in this division as well. As far as Ibelis Diamete, I feel like the defeat did not necessarily hurt them. It was a good match. Again, they're still not signed, but they're still making strides on both Dynamite and Dark. Give me your thoughts on this uh, tag match. Um, so this is one match uh, that I went back and watched again. Um, because it was something I, I just wanted to see more of. Uh, the only thing that really just 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 killed this match for me is I hate when they have to go to commercial break and they have to do that picture in picture segment. Yeah, uh, it, it's just, it was like it's like oh it's like yeah it's just, it, it's it's one of those matches. It's like it's pay per view quality that you're getting on TV. Then something like that has to kill it. But regardless. Um, uh, I think that those four women are some of the best uh, w women's wrestlers that are out there today. Um, I I'm a huge fan of uh, Hikaru Shida. Uh, I recently fallen in love with Thunder Rosa and uh, love Diamante and uh, uh, Ivelisse. I mean, uh, I I've wanted to see more of Diamante and Ivelisse since their debut. Um, we got to see them work with some cream of the crop talent. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there, was, there, there was a lot of great high-flying action that I think uh, worked really well for the match. Uh, so, I mean, now it's like, okay, well, wh where do you go with these two champions now? Um, so, we'll see. Well, according to Twitter, Fundo Rosa is completely open in October. Just saying, according to what I last saw, after her successful title defense against Priscilla Kelly, man, this woman has no rest. Incredible wrestler. Fighter. I forget what she wanted me to successfully cost in the interview. And then Akar Shida, you think about Vicky and Nyla Rose, they want to go after the gold. I think about Big Swole, who got the win over Britt Baker at that uh, tooth and nail match. I think about Britt Baker, who apparently is coming back this coming week. I'm sure you're happy about that. And I think about Shauna, who lends, wants us to lend her energy, our energy to her, and will be back soon. And I think about Chris Statland, who's on the road to recovery. I think about Abaddon, who's lurking. Yeesh. I think about Penelope Ford, who had a strong match with her during a uh, fighter fest, fight for the fall, and forget which one. I think about others who aren't signed, including Kylan King, Danny Jordan, Red Velvet even, for that matter. So there's a lot of potential. And of course, I think about Ali, yay Ali, who I would love to see one day challenge for the AEW Women's World Championship, because I believe she can definitely be a Women's World Champion. But again, we'll have to uh, wait and see. But before we get into our main event, they did subtly talk about what's to come next week. We got our 20-minute brush of greatness match with FTR taking on SCU. As far as I know, these brush of greatness matches are not for the title. Maybe they'll actually lead to title matches, but I guess we'll wait and see. We got Isaiah Cassidy taking on the uh, Demo God, as he's now known. Or the Million Dollar Man, excuse me. Not Million Dollar Man. Million View Man. That's what he's now known for. My bad. Uh, Chris Jericho. We got Britt Baker, who will be back. I don't remember whether or not they said back in action or just back uh, is, next week. Is back, we'll is back in action. Okay, so she will sure. be uh, in the ring, so good deal. We'll see if, that, if she's uh, fully recovered and what she brings and uh, who she goes up uh, against. We also know, even though they, they were supposed to be in a tag match, it's official now. Ricky Starks, absolute Ricky Starks from Team Taz, will finally take on one-on-one -on -one Darby Allen. That is going to be interesting in itself. And I think that's everything happening uh, next week with Baker in action as far as uh, challenging. Blew. 
Well, John Moxley's supposed to be in action next week, too. Okay, I was wondering about uh, John Moxley. Let's go ahead and talk about that, because that leads us to our main event as AEW World Champion, John Moxley defends the title against the Mad King Eddie Kingston, who, by the way, came out by himself. Respect. This was a hell of a fight. Damn. As JR yeah. said, slobber knocker time. Enough said. And literally, the two, they lock up initially, and then they just start slapping one another in the face. And literally, Eddie Kingston is challenging John Moxley, hit me harder. Hit me freaking harder. And Eddie just stood his ground, just taking it to the champion, finding him tooth and nail, punch for punch. He punched Moxley apparently in the kidneys and then whipped Moxley into the timekeeper table. That was a real turning point for me uh, in that match. Kingston took it to the streets. Go figure. Ran him into the barricade because Eddie Kingston can play John Moxley's game. We all know when John Moxley's outside of the ring, you think that's his world. Again, Eddie Kingston, real talk. He and Moxley are cut from the same cloth. They both know how to play in this world. And it came heavily into effect here. Uh, following this, they said uh, Challenger garnered momentum. Moxley fought back, though, with a lariat and a suicide dive. Papai Suicida, Tony Schiavone's favorite move, to uh, Eddie Kingston. And then we get some uh, knee strikes, those uh, knee strikes. And a pile driver, but Kingston broke the pin by simply touching the ropes. He were touching. So it really showed how far these two are pushing each other, but how aware Eddie Kingston is. Moxley caught off guard then with Powerbomb for a good near fall as well. Eddie Kingston explosive. And then we get a headbutt. Why do people resort to a headbutt in wrestling? But then backdrop driver for another uh, near fall. And as this continued, Kingston, he was about to put the nail in the coffin with his spinning back fist, but Moxley blocked it, applied a sleeper, and transitioned into the bulldog choke. And literally, Kingston passed out. His body gave up on him. He never tapped out. He just tapped. He just was done. What an interesting finish that I feel that like protects Eddie Kingston in defeat and makes me want to see this match again and believes that Eddie Kingston has another purpose to point to put over that he deserves a rematch. But we all know in less than 25 days, Lance Archer, I'm sure, was watching out for a far. He is challenging John Moxley now officially for that title at the AEW Dynamite Anniversary Show, which, of course, will take place October 14th. So you think we're done here? Nope, because who comes out? The family. Well, part of them. Lucha Brothers, Penta, and Ray Phoenix, they come out, super kick John Moxley, and they get the better of the champion as Eddie Kingston slowly regains consciousness. Only for Willpower Will Hobbs to try and come in, play difference maker for a moment. But that doesn't work after he is double super kicked to the mat. So right now, it is a three on two assault as Eddie Kingston is pissed off. But who comes out to help John Moxley, of all people? Darby Allen, which is weird because honestly, he had no like beef with any of these men. But he did have beef with somebody that came out and speared him in the next week as Darby Allen was garnering momentum for the faces here. Ricky Starks out of nowhere. What a spear! Speared the hell out of the guy. Not of his shoes, though, but speared the hell out of the guy. And then rammed the skateboard into uh, Darby Allen's body. And then, of course, Rochambeau. And then Kingsland literally got back to the champ and choked him out while the Lucha Brothers and Ricky Starks watch on. And Taz, who suddenly comes out. So Team Taz, Eddie Kingsland family, they stand above the champion, willpower, and the relentless one as we head into next week. What a wild main event and another wild ending and a swerve in a way towards what we were getting uh, previously, but still that idea of is the champion with all the momentum right now heading closer to the anniversary show. Dr. Bradley, give me your thoughts on the championship match and the ending of this week's Dynamite. Good grief. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a reason why John Moxley was voted number one by – by PWI, um, you know, there, there's, I've, I've always been a huge fan of John Moxley, um, it, it, prior to, you know, joining AEW, uh, mm-hmm. just great, great worker in the ring, excellent in ring psychology. Um, the guy sells, um, his, his character is just, you know, He's just a total badass. He's someone that you want to cheer, that you want to get behind, that when he starts getting his ass kicked, he's going to get back up and he's going to be uh, just no holds barred. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you want me to think about a moment from Dynamite that stands out to me other than Cody making his um, return, 
I think about that moment in the ring between Eddie Kingston and um, John Moxley where they just start slapping each other. That was um, crazy. That 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 was oh. that was. Uh, I think that to me, w- when you want to explain in ring psychology to a, a fan that wants to learn more about wrestling, I think that that's a moment right there you can point to. Yeah. And just <clears throat> and, and just having those subtle moments. And just those glares and, and and that selling, those facial reactions, um, it added so much to the intensity that came after uh, with Eddie Kingston throwing him out in the ring. Those two just beating the hell out of each other. Then just the little the little things like you know where he put his foot on the rope and things of that nature. There there were just so many little little nuances that um, made that match special. I mean. You know, and I love the match with Orange Cassidy and uh, um, Brody Lee, Lee, but to me, yeah, to me, this, and as great as that was, to me, this is my favorite match of the night. You know, easy. It was just phenomenal in ring work from both men. Yeah, definitely the definitely the TNT title match with the Cody return and this main event with the epilogue were definitely my top two moments of uh, AEW Dynamite that night, number three being the women's tag but again i wonder what's going on with the women's division and maybe we'll find out when dr Britt baker makes her uh, return next week and again we'll see fcu versus ftr in a 20 minute limit brush of greatness we'll see isaiah cassidy versus uh chris jericho and who and ricky starks versus uh darby allen uh maybe will Hobbs will take on one member of eddie kingston's uh family maybe we'll get followed finally to qt marshall and ali Allie, and see what's going on with butcher and blade and see if the blade is going to do what uh, Eddie Kingston proposed. And also, just a heads up, rest of the week, it was John Moxley. As Excalibur says, nobody has more momentum on his side right now than John Moxley. Whether he's down or whether he's on top, man's always ready for war. He is their champion, and he really has been the top guy in AEW and really wrestling this year. And I'm super curious what's next for him, and of course, among other promotions too. But with that being said, that's all we know going into next week's Dynamite. So before we close here, let me just go ahead and briefly highlight what's to come on Dark as well. We got a nine-match showcase. They're actually taking it easy for once. Can you believe that? Single digits. We got some great debuts coming, too. Uh, we got a tag team match between Ro- Ray Rosas and Risen taking on SCU, Frigga Zarian, Scorpio Sky, ahead of their uh, brush of greatness with FTR. We got Jurassic Express with Marco Stunt taking on Dark Order. Uh, five and 10, mm-hmm. we got, I'm really excited for this debut. Oh, pink, Alex Garcia, current Sailor Pro Women's Champion taking on the super bad girl, Penelope Ford with Kip Saban in her corner. I'm curious what she will bring to AEW, and I hope personally this will not be the uh, only match uh, either, just uh, saying. Uh, what else we got here? We got, Brian Pillman Jr. and Griff Garrison, the best hair duo in AEW. They'll be taking on Serpentico and Lufer, the weirdest team ever. We also got the Natural Nightmares. They are taking on Dark Order. And uh, Kokabuna and uh, John Silver. That's a unique combination. But hey, maybe it means that uh, Kokabuna will bounce back and uh, maybe we'll see more of this whole Blade thing unfold too if they interfere just because. We're also going to get yeah. Nana Rose with Vicky Guerrero. Oh, God. Please don't say it. Taking on fashionista, as she's known, Rache Chanel. So it should be an interesting uh, night of uh, matches. Oh, wait. Where are my matters? We also have – wait. Am I looking at this right? Hold on here. Yeah, I am. Sorry. That's why. I'm, I'm looking at multiple posts. We also have Megan her dark debut, and we don't know whether or not she's going to join the Dark Order or do her own thing. We still have no follow-up, yeah. and that's another name considered in the women's division. We have no follow-up when Ty Conti was saved by Hikaru Shida from Nala Rose for her destruction. But Ty Conti, she will be in action on Dark as well in her debut match against Red Velvet, straight for your mama's kitchen. We also got the best friends taking on M. Badu and I, uh, what's his name? B. Ship King, B. S. H. P. King. Okay. Cesar Benoit, former NXT star, will be teaming up with the captain, Sean Dean, to take on the Gun Club, uh, Austin, and Billy Gunn. And those are our matches, it looks like, for AEW Dark this coming week. So there's a couple of matches here that I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to uh, Anna Garcia's uh, debut. 
Um, I look at the rest of this card and I wonder what's next for the Natural Nightmares. I also look at, can Brian Pillman Jr. Who the fuck is Griff Garrison? Can they actually finally <laughs> get a win? But then again, Luffy's a signed guy, so this is what I do. I don't see that happening. And I wonder also, can we get maybe some more fallout from when is friggin' Brandon Cutler and Peter Avalon gonna face each other again? I need a conclusion to that. Make Leva base the special guest referee or Leva. Men them together. Make the initiative again. Just saying. Uh, but that being said, that's all I gotta say regarding Dark AW, all things all elite wrestling. So Dr. Bradley, is there anything else on your mind? Any other thoughts as we head towards next week regarding Dark or Dynamite or BTE? What's going on through your head? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know, we talk about the momentum for for John Moxley, um, as Excalibur had said. Um, so, you know, we know that Lance Archer is getting his opportunity coming up on the anniversary show Dynamite, I thought October fourteenth. Correct. But, two weeks, two weeks, basically. And, well, yeah, exactly. the, in, in, in the interim, though. What what do you do with them? Um, I mean, do you, do you hold off and, and just have them just maybe kind of show up and maybe cut some promos? Do you, do you find just one more match just to kind of keep that momentum? I feel like John Moxley is going to want one more match after what happened with him tonight with somebody. Yeah. And, and, and how do you – but in the same token is how do you also – give Lance Archer the momentum he needs to look like a legitimate threat. So I'm and interested Nate Roberts to speak on his behalf. Remember, he said he's going to be in quarantine for a couple of weeks. They're clearly going to build this like a road to dynamite special. And one more thing, yeah. uh, my bad, it's three weeks because next week is October 30th. The following week is October 7th. Oh, how did I forget this? And on October 7th, we're celebrating 30 years of the GOAT, Chris Jericho. And then the following week's the anniversary show of Dynamite. At some point within the next two weeks, we're going to have to get together and look at the last, the first year of Dynamite. That's for damn sure. But anyway, continue. Um, you know, it, <laughs> you, you brought up 30 years of Chris Jericho. I think that uh, – It's crazy. I mean, it's like, how do we, how, how do we forget that? Um, <laughs> I mean, know, it was we, solely we, mentioned, we, we, okay? Well, That's the so so you, you got a point. Jake Roberts would be the mouthpiece. Now I want to switch gears and and and, and talk about Chris Jericho because it's um, there's so much they could do to talk about those 30 years and and I think what's really what helps bring things full circle is the fact that yeah I remember Chris Jericho's big de in ring debut with WCW where he was on TV where where may, many fans who followed him from the beginning remember him from now he's he he's once again back with guys like. Tony Schiavone, who were there from the beginning. Yeah. So it's gonna be it's it's gonna be interesting to see what they do to celebrate thirty years of wrestling. Um, yeah, because again, he's done it all. Think about the different character mores. We had the man of a thousand and one holes, armbar, 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 armbar. We had Mister. Uh, Lion himself, we forgot New Japan Pro Wrestling. We had the show himself when he took on The Rock in his opening statement in the WWF. We've had the guy that came to save us, but then it was only to save himself. We had the guy that wanted to surpass Shawn Michaels. We had the guy with the light up jacket. We had the guy with the list of Jericho. We had the guy who became the pain maker. We have the guy that has now given himself four different names since being part of AEW. We have the guy that's been the commentary guy with AEW Dynamite during this COVID time. Really brings a whole different dynamic. We have the guy that created this strong fashion called the Inner Circle, leading the future. We have the guy, the GOAT, the man of professional wrestling that literally has done everything possible in professional wrestling and is still going now and literally is approaching 30 years. What the hell? Now said. I can, only yeah. imagine, I can only imagine what sort of craziness is going to ensue on that special as well. I got to imagine on the anniversary show, he's going to be involved in a match. He's going to do commentary. Maybe he'll do ring introduction. What do you do to celebrate Chris Jericho? Do you give him dynamite? 
at the very least, you you have some sort of video package with opening narration from Tony Schiavone. Oh, uh, yeah. And good old JR, because again, he respects uh, JR. Oh, and let's get yeah. Pineapple Pete in there so I can say, Pineapple Pete, I hate that guy. <laughs> exactly. We haven't heard that. It's before. Pineapple Pete. Pineapple Pete, I hate that guy. You're still, you're still waiting for Pineapple Pete and Orange Cassidy to become a tag team. <laughs> the day that you happens. Never know. The day the internet breaks and I break pine and I drink pineapple orange juice. I guarantee you that. All right. Woo. Well, good Lord. With that being said, I think that's a perfect way to wrap up. I think we literally just did a standard edition. <laughs> I think that's a perfect way to wrap up this episode of AEW Spark for the upcoming week. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, tuning in. Uh, Britt Baker, I can't wait to see what she says and brings because she's a dentist. And I respect the role model. And honestly, just make it full gear already. I want to see Britt Baker versus Hikaru Shida. That's the last big thing I have to say tonight. And with that being said, mm -hmm. I really don't have anything else to say regarding AEW. If you all have questions, thoughts, or some sort of fantasy bookings for AEW Dynamite or what you hope, who you hope to see on Dark, what you want to see more of on Dark, I hope to see more independent versus independent matches versus independent and AEW matches personally, like Lee Johnson, Ben Carter. Find that balance is what AEW Dark needs to do, in my opinion. Just saying. Congrats, by the way, the Nightmare Factory on their first uh, camp, it seems. Looks like they put out pictures regarding it. Uh, I wish the Nightmare Factory and everyone involved all the best, as well as Dustin Rhodes and his new wrestling school. And that's all I have to say about that. And I look forward, of course, to watching AEW Dynamite live next week and Dark, also prior to it, because I'm watching Back Wrestling Live Tuesday nights. Uh, Dr. Bradley, this is always an extreme pleasure. Maybe we'll start doing this on Saturdays going forward. I don't know whether or not next Saturday we'll do the one-year retrospective and see if others join us or if we'll do it afterwards. We definitely need to figure out some time before that because you consider AW Dynamite's one-year anniversary was technically October 2nd. So actually, next week Saturday makes the most sense because next week Saturday is October 3rd. So maybe we'll do it then. We'll talk more throughout the week. But besides thinking about retrospecting a year of Dynamite, which, good Lord, that's going to be fun. Anything you want to plug, promote, uh, suggest, and where can people find you to talk? Anything. Um, well, um, you can find me on, uh, on Facebook. You can also find me on uh, Team All Elite uh, page <laughs> on, um, on Facebook. I, I do a lot of posts there and, and interact with different fans of, of pro wrestling and AEW. Uh -huh. um, you can also uh, find me just in my car in my basement rocking out because you know that's th yeah that's that's what I do. Um, nice. Uh, that and uh, you can also find me um, uh, helping to protect the communities as I am giving lots of flu shots right now. So yeah. All right. I mean, hey, I know I got that coming up soon. So again, keep doing what you're doing. But again, be safe. I thank you. I pray for you and your family every day. And I look thank forward you. to our next uh, discussion. And I think, yeah, next week, Saturday, folks. Next week, Saturday, Spark. I'm going to see if I can get as many people as I can. I think we're going to do our one-year retrospective on AEW Dynamite. So Dr. Bradley, get ready. And that will include pay-per-views too. Because what a first year for this brand. My God. Oh, God. But with that being said, that'll be next week, Saturday, and we'll figure out time and talk more about that then. But in the meantime, folks, you want to know more and more about the, 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 I'm tired. You want to know more about me, <laughs> know this. I'm just a simple man and a lifelong fan of dot, 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 wrestling. So follow me, Instagram, Twitter, PlayStation, and in Foster1916. Keep following the civil YouTube channel here at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash no foster 10 for all things wrestling. Shout out to my ATW family on Twitter. And if you want to know what I'm about, it's in the description down below. I keep it simple for you. Support, no DQ, WrestleJoy, Team All Elite, Pro Wrestling Discussion, Support and Proud Wrestling, that's the Harvard folks, Red Cherry Brand, Jeff Beach Network, I could go on and on. And as always, I like to close. Support your wrestling outlets, both big and small, and let's keep growing. This incredible, diverse, unique, elite, authentic, unscripted, unrestricted wrestling community together. Simple as that. With that being said, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, tell a friend. Hit the bell notification that goes live on this channel. Hit the subscribe button. Help me keep growing this channel. Shout out to all 162. This has been with me on this fun YouTuber creator's journey. It's not leaving anytime soon. More content to come. I just created a new series that reviews NXT and NXT UK now. Every week called the NXT Scene. Go check out episode one. It should be uploaded shortly. 
I'll be back tomorrow with a simple take following G1 Clan Next 30, day five action that is literally in a few hours. So I'm going to go straight to sleep. So with that being said, stay tuned for more content from this channel as always regarding all things wrestling. Further content to come and within one month, less than one month now, an anniversary stream for the second year of me as a YouTuber. I can't thank y'all enough for just welcoming me into your uh, viewership or ears. I hope you've enjoyed the content and enjoyed the fun too. And I'd love to collab and work with any of you encourage YouTubers or spiritually fans like this gentleman here. So for all of Team All Elite, for all Elite Wrestling, he is Dr. Bradley Campbell. I am the simple man, Noah Foster. I'm not trying out for a commentary job. I just like wearing blazers because they fit my pins. I hope you all take care and enjoy life. Tomorrow's there guaranteed. Trust your families. Enjoy wrestling. There's more of it now than ever. Find a friend, make an enemy if you choose to. I don't judge you. But make something out of it. Let it connect with you. Join this fun, vast, positive side of the wrestling community too. There's a lot of good in it despite the controversy and bad. You'd be surprised. That's how me and this gentleman met up and connected spiritually and as fans too. So until then, I just hope you all exercise caution, be safe, be positive, wear a mask over your face and nose, be aware of the environment and the situation that concerns you and surrounds you and your family members and loved ones. Stay safe, pray for all those affected, wrestling or non-wrestling. We will get through this pandemic and this era of our lives together. There's a brighter tomorrow on the horizon, but focus on today and do the best you can with it. And until the next video, I just hope you all, whatever time it is, in my case, have a wonderful night. That's it. Everyone, the elite. Non-copyright, 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 non-copyright. All right, we're done here. Good night, everybody. All right, thank you for singing with me. Nah, nah, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. We're done. <laughs>